Hello and welcome to Mission Control. This is a podcast focusing on nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Unaduce, and I am really pleased to have Linda Vale. Uh, what would you consider your title? I am the health officer, Ingham uh, County Health, health officer. officer of Ingham County Health Department. Well, welcome to Mission Control, Linda. Appreciate you being here. Well, Paul, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Well, first of all, how I want to start this and how I start each of them going forward is what's the mission? What's your mission statement for Ingham County Health Department? Well, I'm going to read it for you so that I don't miss it because, you know, it's hard to memorize mission statements. So our mission statement is to protect, improve, and advocate for the health and well-being of our community by identifying and advancing the conditions under which all people can achieve optimum health. Awesome. Really nice and succinct. That's great. So tell me, how did you end up as the health officer for the Ingham County Health Department? So, well, first of all, I was the health officer for the Kalamazoo County Health Department and had been for seven years. And then um, Dr. Renee Kennedy, who was the health officer here just before me, um, resigned and went to Michigan Public Health Institute to be their CEO. And um, um, in a way, Renee suggested that maybe I want, might want to might want to look into it. Would I consider it? That sort of thing. So it all, it all kind of started there, and that's how I, in the end, ended up here. Now, speaking of Kalamazoo, it seems like we have a little bit of a uh, uh, kind of a something in common that I didn't expect when I was looking over your LinkedIn profile. We both went to Western Michigan. I did. I got my. I got a master's degree there. Yes, I did. I got a master's in public administration at Western Michigan University. Go Broncos. Go Broncos. But I have to tell you, my real team. Yes. Because, you know, usually you align with that undergraduate team, right? Yep, you do. You do. Yeah. University of Georgia. Oh. Georgia Bulldogs. The Georgia Bulldogs. Well, congratulations. Thank you so very much. That is that is great. <laughs> I'm, a- I'm adding a uh, national championship Coke bottle to my collection now because the last time they won a national championship, I was actually in college there. And Herschel Walker was playing football. Wow. That is incredible. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, how did you end up, how did the road from Georgia to Kalamazoo, how, how was that? Well, I was, uh, my, my degree's in microbiology. Um, and then I was, did, went to graduate school in microbiology there as well. Um, ended up working in a laboratory there for a couple of years. Um, left there and went to Vanderbilt University Medical Center and worked in their biochemistry department for a couple of years. And then um, the, the lead investigator in the laboratory that I was working with had had some connections with the Upjohn company prior to that and basically, you know, ended up, you know, getting kind of applying to getting recruited by the Upjohn company to come work here and do my biomedical research. So I, I have... Uh, a fairly long career in biomedical research as well prior to becoming um, a health per- public health person. So I started in public health in 2002, but I started working in research labs in 1982. So, Okay. And so, so you, um, you went into the Kalamazoo public health nope. area. Uh, I, went, I worked for the Upjohn Company, pharmaceutical research. Right on. Right. So that's how I got to Kalamazoo. Okay. All right. And so why, why this shift to like community-based health? Well, you know, I kind of stumbled in, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to say I did it with lots of intent, but I did not. I worked in a laboratory. I, all I knew to do was bench research. Um, I was a molecular biologist, biochemist at the time working on um, infectious disease genomics and uh, that was right around the time the Pfizer acquired what was then Pharmacia. They, they were no longer Upjohn. And um, I had actually left to, um, to take a little bit of time off with my son and had just come back. So I didn't have all my seniority back. And I was one of the first people that Pfizer laid off when they laid off employees. So I actually lost my job um, and had to find a job. So I spent a little bit of time 
um, living on unemployment and trying to figure out how I was going to keep my house and keep their, my kids in their home and all that sort of stuff. And ultimately ended up um, applying for a job at the Kalamazoo County, essentially, health department. It was a fairly entry-level job, but it was enough to stay instead of have to move and uproot my kids. Um, I was divorced by that time, so I didn't want to, you know, take them away from their dad. And that's how I ended up at the Kalamazoo County Health Department. So being in uh, the public health world and coming from where you were coming from, the research w- world, how has that meshed? How did how were you able to mesh what you knew into what you're doing now? How Was there... Was there a connection there? Oh, there's lots of connections. Like I said, I was working in infectious disease genomics. My my under my degree is microbiology, mm-hmm. which is in infectious infectious diseases. You know, what we're doing right now is a big infectious disease, you know, pandemic. Um, so, and that is my background. Uh, in addition to having an infectious disease background, um, when I was at the Epjohn Company slash pharmacy doing research, I ended up. You know, they move you around a lot in cancer research, in vascular biology research, um, in central nervous systems research. So I I knew a lot about the various diseases and things outside of even infectious diseases, which has always allowed me to basically um, think through a lot of the different things that we deal with in community in terms of health and health conditions. And honestly, sometimes to even be able to speak to the media and, and not you know, not be afraid of not saying the right thing. I had a health officer um, that I worked for in Kalamazoo that was, his background was in mental health. And he didn't do a lot of speaking to the media because he didn't know all the science words. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know, so when you come into it with a science background, there's a lot of it that's really quite helpful. And the other helpful part about it is that it really, um, it gives you a solid foundation in data right? So I'm still a data person. I still look for data. And data crosses everything from, you know, COVID data to, you know, finance data. Every, you know, the da- you can look at data around lots and lots and lots of di- things. And so I'm fairly data-driven when it comes to, you know, assessing where we are and where we're going and what's going on in the department. And, and that, I believe, has also been helpful. And I think that's how those wor- worlds have meshed together. And then, um, just apparently, you know, I didn't know where I was going once I got to the Kalamazoo County Health Department, but four and a half years in, I became their health officer after not having worked in public health at all before that. So um, I guess I just had some natural leadership skills that somebody recognized, and that was the beginning. And so then you ended up in the Ingham Ingham County Health Department. Mm -hmm. And did you come in at did you work into the health officer position where you were, or did you just lateral from Kalamazoo to here? I came here to be the health officer here. That's that's how I was hired here. So I left there as the health officer, and I came here to be health officer. And that is now almost eight years ago. Wow. Okay. That's great. So let's, let's uh, circle back a little bit um, how you were talking about how – your background in research really meshed into what you were doing in public health. And fast forward to 2020. Um, Obviously, when we entered 2020, we had no idea what was, at least the general public had no idea what was coming. Mm -hmm. Um, But how informed were you in the early part of 2020 before the whole I don't want to say blow up, but obviously, you know, the decision to, um, you know, with the shutdown and at least, I mean, what were you looking at? What were you seeing um, from your standpoint and from your whole background going into that march? What you were seeing was a recipe for what could potentially become a fairly serious global pandemic. I mean, if you looked at it in the early stages have a, you know, immunology, infectious diseases, virology, you know, microbiology background whatsoever and know how, um, you know, a novel virus that jumps from an animal into humans and then becomes easily transmissible human to human, which is the formula for becoming a pandemic because the next thing is it's easily transmissible human to human. 
No human body has ever seen it before, so there's no immunity. And then it spreads globally, and then it becomes a pandemic. And, you know, the hallmark signs were all there. And quite honestly, trying to contain, once we saw what was going on in Wuhan, um, the likelihood of being able to contain it was not looking very good. Um, and as it started spreading, just as you saw Omicron and mm -hmm. Delta before that, oh, it's here. Well, it's like, no, you're not going to stop it from getting here. You're not. Um, so it, it, you know, that background led me to believe that it was start. It was time to start planning and preparing. Um, it was time to start planning and preparing the community for the fact that it was pretty darn likely. It was probably a matter of when, not if, and really to reassure the community that you know these are things that we had planned for and had plans for, and that we were prepared. Um, that is all true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we were prepared, but. You know, things, as you know, have unraveled over the last, now we're in our third year of it, um, you know, lots of different ways. This has been um, a very, you know, from a microbiology perspective, which, like, again, is my, is my background, has been just really, I, I say it to my medical director a lot, who's an infectious disease physician as well. It's like, this is a very strange virus. And it's a very difficult one to predict, too. It has been. Um, so... That was also kind of some uniquenesses in it. You know, you're just kind of looking and trying to figure things out at times that just don't seem to add up and make sense. And that's science, you know. Science is a very iterative process of, you know, learning things and having a hypothesis and being in a space and then learning more and having to drift from that space. That has become a large criticism of our profession mm -hmm. um, in that it turns for some reason into well, you told us this before, and now that's not right, so you just you didn't know what you were doing. It's like, no, it's science. We learned. Um, we didn't know anything about this virus when it first came either, and we have had to make our best informed decisions all along the way and listen to a lot of research, watch a lot of you know, anecdotal, you know, what's going on in the world, just, you know, what's happening, and figure out from there you know, exactly what we're dealing with and how to do our best to uh, mitigate the spread. Uh, containment, when you have, especially now when you're looking at Omicron, with just such such incredible transmissibility and such widespread community transmission, um, those are not the things that you very easily isolate and quarantine your way out of. You know, uh, uh, an outbreak, you know, of a few hundred in a fairly contained, you know, area. It's like you can case investigate and contact trace and kind of put a ring around that and stop it. But, you know, widespread community transmission like this makes it very challenging to do something like that. And that's what you've seen us doing is being very challenged to contain this. Um, you know, the shutdowns and those things like that early on were very important because, again, we didn't know what we were doing dealing with and didn't have vaccine, didn't have treatments, hadn't learned as much about treatment. And so that kept us at a point where community spread at least came down some while we managed some of this and most importantly managed hospital capacity. That's what we were really looking for in the beginning. Um, I think if you look back at all that flatten the curve stuff, it never showed you that there weren't going to be cases. Mm -hmm. What it showed you is that if we don't contain it, we're going to have a lot of cases really fast, and then they're going to come down, and hospital capacity is here. It's going to far exceed it. And that if we do these other things and flatten the curve, we'll still have the cases. They're just going to spread out over time. So if you remember those flatten the curve graphs, we never really said we're going to stop it. What we said is, we, we need it not to all happen at the same time. Mm. Our health system can't handle everybody getting COVID all at the same time. Well, I'm hearing a couple of different things here. As number one, the way you are approaching it, you know, fast, fact based, science based, you know, this is what happens. These are the things that, uh, that we can. Uh, understand what the flow of this virus, what we can understand and what we can understand. Here are some aspects that of knowledge that we have to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. How hard was that to, to communicate? Because that sounds where the way you said it sounds very, okay, well, that makes sense. But mm -hmm. other folks trying to decipher what you're saying, how hard was that to communicate, especially during the, 
like the lockdown phase when everybody's like confused and scared and then this and that, how hard was that to communicate? Well, it was very challenging at times because, you know, I was always, you know, I was doing media briefings twice weekly. I was talking to the media, of course, all the time and trying to give the best information based on what I knew at the time. And there were certainly times and we would, my, my medical director and I would even say, well, we're going to have to walk that back because we'd learn something new. Um, and so, you know, just like if you look at what's going on with Omicron right now, and especially a few weeks ago when it first came out and people were saying, oh, it's um, more transmissible and less severe. Well, that was early and anecdotal evidence. And so you kind of had to say, it looks like it's more transmissible and it may be less severe. We don't really have all the information on that yet. So as much as you can, you say things like that. Whether people hear that part of it or not is a whole other thing. So, you know, you, and some, some of it's, you know, quite honestly, and, and not to, to dismiss or anything the media, because the media has been a huge partner to me in this, because they help us, you know, get that information out there. But, you know, a media headline will, you know, carry off with something that's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not quite accurate. And so... Sometimes those little snippets get picked up by the media, and that's what people hear as opposed to what you're trying to tell them, which is, yes, I understand that a doctor in South Africa has said that, you know, based on what he has seen in an entire, you know, 100 patients or whatever, that it looks less severe. But that's not robust enough information to make that a full-blown, flat-out conclusion yet. And so... You just kind of have to work with some of that ambiguity, unfortunately, and make sure that people understand that there is, we need to learn more about it before we can be absolutely sure about that. But this is what we know now. And what we can do is act based on what we know right now. So in essence, what what do you think um, over the course of, obviously, this short period of your career, this two to three year span, um, what were your biggest accomplishments you felt? What, what did you think that, yeah, I landed that, that was, that, that worked out well? Oh my goodness. I think that, I think that we landed a lot of things very well, quite honestly. Um, you know, we had some issues, um, in 2020 early on as, um, things were coming out. We had a, you know, we had a lot of cases in a particular part of our community, and it was really hard to, you know, it's like, why do we have so many cases there? And again, I, I dug into the data, you know, so I get out the data and I look at all of them, and you know, it was, it was um, some concentrations of, you know, this is a welcoming community. We are a large refugee resettlement area, and we had populations of people that were all working in certain places and carpooling to certain places and living in a small community and, and fairly closely together in apartment complexes that don't necessarily have a, a lot of room, you know, large family, multi-generational family kinds of things. And what we were seeing was really, an, an within the community, almost a community-wide outbreak in, inside of that and kind of um, identifying that and then basically targeting services and things like that towards that population. Then fast forward, we had some issues with the university. Um, of course, we had a, a, a significant outbreak on our hands that was associated um, with the university in East Lansing as well. And, and that uh, we, you know, we got our hands around that as well. Um, it certainly made national news, um, so that was kind of that was interesting to end up on CNN and things like that at, at points in time. Um, but but we really managed that whole situation, I thought, quite well. And then um, could not be more proud of the Ingham County Health Department um, in partnership with many many people in this community, but strong partnership with MSU University, Michigan State University, I should say. Um, and the mass vaccination operations we had out at the MSU Pavilion. So we, we I mean, honestly, we just really nailed that. Um, that was just, uh, it, was a, it was a sight to see. I mean, many, many people refer to it as a well-oiled machine, and indeed it, it seemed to be just exactly that. And I can't take a whole lot of credit for that. My team put that together, and we'd go out there and tweak a few things every now and then to improve or increase flow or, you know, just unconfuse things that tended to get confused. And it was always a work of progress of, you know, just continuous improvement throughout that entire time. Um, so 
that was also probably something that I think that we really nailed. Well, um, as someone who actually witnessed and went through that pavilion area vaccination, it, I would have to agree <laughs> with that. Even, yeah, it was just it was a well oiled well oiled machine. Both times you went through, it was great. It was really real well done. And um, as a side note, here's something that probably not a lot of folks can say from my standpoint was my car died. <laughs> and we, and we, we had a solution for that too. You did have a solution for that. <laughs> you had me go through where people walk up, they called somebody to jump. Like uh, it was, an, it was amazing. And it, and it never, it, it just still went, still went with the flow. Uh-huh. Even, <laughs> I was like, that's how well oiled a machine it was. Cause I'm like, well, oh, because I thought that morning, I'm like, I'm going to get up and test the... No, I did not. That was just... You test the system. Test my the car's system. My car's going to break down yeah. right here. I'm going to make I'm yeah. gonna make my car break down. Because, yes, my car broke down, but they, they, that team had... Your team had already faced that an hour or two earlier. And so it was like... <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Yeah, we had that thing that yep. you carry over and jump a car with after that. And so, yeah, that was... Yep. And we had a couple of times where we had leaks, you know, gasoline leaks from cars, you know, oil spill kits. The the spill kits were right there, um, just ready to go. They had the, um, oh, they had that machine um, like they use on the ice arenas. They called it the same thing as Zamboni, but it's probably not a Zamboni. But anyway, they would, during the wintertime, as we had all those cars driving through those lanes, if there had been a big snow, of course, you know, we're getting lots and lots of water in there. Well, eventually we were going to be sloshing around in giant puddles. So, by gosh, in comes the Zamboni or whatever machine, and they'd drive it up and down those aisles and vacuum up all of that water from the snow coming through, and that was kind of a regular process, and that kind of kept us from wading around in in pools of water as we tried to do our work. (laughs) It was just awesome. It was awesome to see. So, on the flip side of what did you thought went really well, what are some things that you learned uh, about yourself, the community, the things that you put in place that you may have thought, well, that could have went better or, what, you know, how did you get stronger? Um, I would say resilience is probably the biggest thing um, because it's, it's, um, it's like trying to run a marathon at sprint pace, which really isn't possible. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the best thing I could liken it to. And to be able to just figure out a way to just keep your momentum and keep going, you know, day after day after day. And that's not to say I didn't have some bad days. Uh, I did. I had, if I had my bad days and I've had my meltdowns and I've had my times when it's like, I, I just don't know how to just keep on going. But you do learn to figure, figure that out, give yourself that space, um, and just keep on going. Sometimes... I, I don't know if maybe that in the end was in in everybody's best interest or not, because what we've also learned is that the public health workforce, after there was a giant survey about depression and anxiety and PTSD and the general public, the healthcare workers, the first responders and the public health workers, and the people who scored highest on all of those things were people in public health, anxiety, depression, PTSD. And when you keep pushing yourself and pushing yourself in that war, I mean, we are, we're, in, we're at war with an invisible enemy, in a sense. And you just have to keep fighting that battle. And it's a tough one. And so there's definitely a lot of stress and a lot of trauma and all of that dealt with it. And a lot of that is just stuff that as public health leaders, as other people in public health, we're living with right now. And we're keeping on going through it. But at some time, when, when we get to the end of it, a lot of us are going to have to figure out a way to decompress and figure out how to get that stuff, you know, out of our systems. At this point in time, it's very hard for me to sleep um, past a certain time in the morning. And when I do wake up, I wake up with just kind of an overwhelming sense of heaviness and just it's really hard to describe. And so I'm ready to quit waking up that way every morning. Um, but I, 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 ha- I just feel like I have a job to do. And that there is no way to step away from it and say somebody else needs to do it for a while. You're a health officer. It's really not an option. And so I can keep going. But, you know, I used to run marathons, too. So 
I, you know. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. So so I've learned that I keep can keep going. Um, I've learned how to be thick skinned. I've learned how incredibly important it is to have the leaders of your community behind you. So no matter the noise, and it's the noise of a very vocal minority um, about, you know, all of the nasty stuff and the terrible things people say, and you're lying and you're making it up and this doesn't work or that didn't happen. And, you know, oh, you're only reporting those COVID deaths because people are paying you. It's like nobody pays us for any deaths. There's no money in a death being coded one way for another. That's, it's just totally false. And, and so you get a lot of that. But when you know that your board of commissioners, who are my bosses, and not your board, just your board of commissioners, but, you know, everybody from the Chamber of Commerce to the university to the mayors and city councils of both of the larger cities in town and, you know, the United... I mean, I could go on and on and on about the leaders in this community um, and the fact that, that I have their support. And when I have their support, they carry that message you know, kind of through with for you. And so it's just been incredibly invaluable to have that support. And that's based on relationships. Um, so prior relationships, of course. Um, but I was thrust into developing some new relationships at the same time. And so how you go about developing those new re relationships and getting trust and then moving forward together um, probably are some of the biggest things that I learned in all of those challenges. Hmm. That's great. I don't know how to follow it up from there, but I really appreciate you being on this podcast. It was really great. Is there anything else that you want to bring up that we did not touch on? Not that I can think of, Paul. I'm like, oh, we, we just finished that up already so fast. I guess <laughs> because I talk so much. <laughs> no, no, it was perfect. But uh, so thank you again. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. And uh, um. And for all of you listening, thank you for taking the time, some time to listen to our program. So don't miss the next episode. That will be coming out in a couple of weeks. And if there's someone you know of that you would like to hear about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at unaduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. Thank you. See you next time in the Control Center. This is Paul Schmidt.